Uh, so in the last lecture, we were starting to talk about like, kind of some of the practical aspects of how to do interval arithmetic. So we need to take control over rounding modes for the processor. And we looked at functions that we can use for basically setting and getting the rounding modes. Uh, there's information on the handout for the next assignment that you're, you're working on where you're implementing interval arithmetic that explains how with GCC you can tell it, like, because it doesn't support the pragma I talked about in the last lecture, the one that basically this one, this one here. Um, and I don't believe Clang supports it either still. It wasn't the case last year, but it doesn't seem to be the case either this year. But GCC has a, a compiler option that you can provide that basically says, like, do this effectively. So it doesn't use a pragma. Anyway, but that's described on the handout for the course, right, for the assignment. So you can look at that. Um, anyway, so I want to talk more about rounding mode. So when you change the rounding mode, the things that are affected by it, it affects quite a few things. So um, any floating point operations other than things that are done in constant expressions um, are, are going to be affected by the rounding mode. Um, most of the mathematical functions in the standard library, so like things like sine, cos, tan, exponential, log, square root, for example, these things are all affected. If you change the rounding mode when they do the computation, like they round the result down or up or however, depending on how you set the rounding mode. Um, if you're converting between different floating point types, like converting a float to a double or long double to a float or something like this, these, these uh, rounding modes take effect as well for those kind of conversions. For converting from string to like floating point types, like str to d converts from a string to a double, I believe. Um, this also takes into effect the rounding modes too. Um, and also uh, some, some of the rounding functions in the, the standards library, like nearby int, r int, lr int. Uh, some things are not affected though. Things that aren't affected by the rounding mode, and no matter how you set it, it's, well, at least assuming you don't have a buggy compiler or something, um, that are guaranteed not to be affected. Um, if you're converting from floating point type to an integer type, the language standard requires that this is done by truncation. It must round towards zero. Um, and the compiler needs to make sure that this happens. Um, anyway, so this is not affected by the rounding mode. Um, any computation that's done in, in constant expressions, like if you're doing constant expert computation, it always uses round to nearest. So for compile time computation, you can't set the rounding mode effectively. It's always round to nearest. And then certain functions in the, in the standard library, it wouldn't really make sense for them to use the rounding mode, like seal. Like if you're doing the sealing, the whole point of the function is to round up. So it, it wouldn't make sense for it to say, oh, the rounding mode is round down, let's round down instead. So these things effectively make sure that the rounding mode is set appropriately for what they're intended to do. Uh, but because many things are affected by the current rounding mode, if you start messing with it, you need to make sure typically that you put it back to what it was before. Like it's not a good idea to do some computation. You change the rounding mode so that you can maybe do some interval arithmetic stuff correctly. Then when you're done, you just leave the rounding mode however you set it. This is probably going to be a disaster because like then the rest of the code is going to be using the wrong rounding modes for whatever it's doing or unexpected rounding modes, which could cause anything from very subtle problems to maybe catastrophic failures in the code. Um, so the basic idea is when you're doing interval arithmetic, you would like save the rounding mode, then change it however you need to do your interval arithmetic stuff, and then when you're done, restore the rounding mode that you saved at the beginning. Um, and this is a, a classic example of using a technique referred to as RAII, which is basically a, a class that its sole purpose to exist is to do cleanup in the destructor, and basically what it does is it you know restores some state or puts something, releases some resources and so on. This is described in more detail on the handout for the assignment. It kind of gives a concrete example of how you can do this, but you can use a class basically to help make it easier for you to correctly restore the rounding mode using what's called an RAI class. So I'll talk more about these types of classes um, later on in the course, but for the moment, it's the information that you need for this assignment is on the handout. Uh, this is just a simple little example of using different rounding modes. It's just computing a square root of two, but we're basically looping over various different, like we have different rounding modes in this array, and then we're just looping over the different values and setting the rounding mode and then computing square root of two and printing the result. And depending on how we choose the rounding mode, you can see like in particular this entry here, we get a different result than the other ones. And, and by the way, this stuff here is just, I'm making sure that I print enough digits that you can actually see that things are different. Um, this max digits 10 is, is guarantees that if I print those that much pre precision, that different numbers actually look different. Because by default, it won't print all the significant digits, perhaps. So you might see, maybe see like 1.5, but it's not really 1.5, it's 1. Point something, something, something. And, and you might take conclusions about things being equal or not equal, it's not really valid. Anyway, so that's what some of this other stuff is doing here. But the main thing here is just to illustrate that if I choose the rounding modes differently, I can get different results. 
And the particular application that we're going to consider interval arithmetic for, so like the assignment that you're working on now, the first part of the assignment, you're essentially developing an interval arithmetic class, like an interval type. And then what you're going to do is you're going to build on top of that and implement some what are called geometric predicates. So we're going to use ge geometry processing as one of the applications of this, uh, this interval arithmetic idea. Um, so in geometry processing, or some people might say computational geometry, depending on how you want to look at things, but basically pre processing of geometry, uh, interval of arithmetic is used very frequently. And one of the reasons for it is that we, we often have uh, predicates in geometry processing where we're asking questions like we have like a line and we have a point. And we want to know, is the point to the left of the line, to the right of the line, or is it on the line? We have a circle and a point. We want to know, is the point inside the circle, outside the circle, or on the border of the circle? Lots of questions like this. These, these are... Although I guess you could strictly say predicates you normally are like true or false things, but kind of you can think of a generalization of predicates, anything that gives a small number of answers, like left of, right of, or on. It's like a trinary kind of predicate. Um, these sorts of things are typically used to make decisions in the code. Like the reason you're asking is the point inside the circle is probably you want to do something special if it is and something different if it isn't. And if you get the wrong answer, if you ask the question with this predicate, like is this point inside the circle, and it gives you the wrong answer due to round off here, that could be a big disaster because like maybe it's really, really important that you do the right thing in that case. Um, so because of this, in, in practice, usually when you're using a floating point computation to make decisions for like that, that are returned by predicates, it's often a big disaster if they, the round off here might give the wrong answer because you're making decisions based on the predicate results in your code. And if the predicate gives the wrong answer, you're going to basically take the wrong branch in your if else, else if structure, and probably that's going to have a bad consequence. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't have written the if, the if else, if else, if else in the first place in your code. And maybe just a little bit more terminology. Sometimes we talk about exact predicates, at least in the, the geometry kind of processing context. When we say exact predicate, what we mean is a predicate that guarantees, even in the presence of round off here, it will always give the right answer. It's exact. It never gives the wrong answer. And in, in practice, this is the type of predicate that we almost always will need to use. There's very few geometric algorithms where you could actually have the algorithm do anything reasonably sane if you use predicates that don't actually give the right answer in some cases. So the basic idea behind how we, we kind of take care of this particular issue kind of the most straightforward way we could address this problem is we just say, well, there's round off here. Let's not use floating point. Let's not use interval arithmetic. Let's just compute the exact answer like we would with pen and paper. Like carry all the significant, like carry all the digits through, don't ever round anything. And if you need 100 million digits to get the answer, well, you compute the number with 100 million digits. Um, but this is expensive. I mean, this is what we refer to as exact arithmetic. Like you can do it. I mean, basically the way that we do things with pen and paper if we want the exact answer. but. But the thing is, it's very expensive because every time you do another computation in practice, what happens is that the amount of memory that's required to represent the number keeps growing and growing because you, you never throw digits away. Just like you get more and more digits in the numbers, it can grow without bounds. The more computation you do, the larger and larger those numbers will get. Uh, so it's very expensive because the numbers can get very large. So to actually do the computation, it's very slow. Also, if the amount of memory can be a problem too because it could start to suck up all the memory in the system. So we don't really want to resort to using exact arithmetic if we don't want to. So the way that interval arithmetic fits into this picture is we do the following. Um, floating point goes out the window. It's useless to us because if we compute an answer with floating point, we have no idea if it's right or not. Like there's no error bound. So we get this number. We don't know. It might be exact. It might be inexact. It could be you know, way out to lunch, like off by 10 to the 20. Uh, so it's useless. But what we can do first of all is we can do the computation with interval arithmetic. So what, that, what this buys us is that maybe if we're lucky, the thing that we're trying to figure out um, the interval that we get in the end, so we do a bunch of computation, we get an interval, and then typically what we do is we test that interval against some condition. Maybe we're checking, see, is the interval greater than zero, or is it equal to zero, or something like this. And we hope that the final thing that we test in the end can be determined. In other words, you don't get an indeterminate result, as we saw with uh, interval arithmetic when you're using relational operators. Sometimes you can get an indeterminate result. In other words, the answer is, I don't know. I don't know if this thing's greater than this thing, or if whether this thing's equal to this thing. But the idea is we try things first with interval arithmetic, hoping that we will actually be able to determine the result that we want. We won't get an indeterminate result. And a lot of the time we'll be lucky. As long as things aren't too you know, badly conditioned, in, in the vast majority of cases, we'll be lucky enough that the interval we compute will give us the thing we want to know. There's some error, but we know that the true answer lies in a particular range, and the fact that it lies in that range is enough that we can say with absolute certainty that the predicate we're trying to compute has this particular result. But of course, in some cases, we won't be so lucky. In some cases, maybe the condition that we end up testing gives an indeterminate result. 
In other words, we can't make a judgment based on the result that we computed with interval arithmetic. So what we do in that case is then we fall back on using exact arithmetic. So the basic idea is we use interval arithmetic first, hoping that we can get the answer that we want. Like we don't end up with something that's indeterminate where we just basically throw up our hands and say we can't say what the answer is. Um, but failing that, then we fall back on exact arithmetic. And the idea is as long as most of the time we end up getting the answer that we want using only interval arithmetic, this would be much faster because interval arithmetic is much, much faster than exact arithmetic. It's approximately, maybe the cost of about like approximately two times maybe floating point because for like addition and subtraction, for example, you're basically doing two adds, two subtracts with rounding modes changed. Um, in practice, though, it's maybe a little bit more than this, sometimes a lot more than this. So some processors, when you change the rounding mode, you take a big hit in terms of performance. Um, but at least kind of in a hand wavy sort of way, you can say maybe it's approximately two times slower than floating point arithmetic. In reality, it'd be a bit more than that, but not too bad. It's not gonna be hundreds or thousands of times slower, uh, which you could easily have with uh, exact arithmetic. Does that make sense? So I guess the basic idea is first use integral arithmetic, hoping that you can get the answer, like an answer which is not indeterminate. And then failing that, then you fall back into the computation. You start over again, basically. You throw everything away, start over with exact arithmetic. But as long as you don't have to do the exact arithmetic that frequently, overall, you come out very far ahead. Um, and in practice, for the sorts of things we're doing and the sorts of applications where this is used in computational geometry, uh, in these situations, it's, it's very rare that you actually have to hit the exact arithmetic case. So this can save you quite a lot. And this is what's called a filtered predicate. Um, Filtering in the sense you're first trying to solve the problem with interval arithmetic. If that doesn't work, then you fall back on exact arithmetic. So I want to give some examples of geometric predicates. And essentially in the assignment that you're going to be you're working on or going to be working on, um, we need to implement, I think, all of the predicates that I'm going to be talking about here. So the first one is one of the most basic types of predicates in, in geometry processing. It's what's called an orientation test, more specifically a two-dimensional orientation test. And it's basically an answer to a very simple question. You have a a directed line, uh, it has a direction is what I mean by directed. So this line basically is a line through A and B and it's directed in the direction that the arrow points. This is a, so basically you can imagine that you're standing on this line segment facing in the direction, or standing on this line facing in the direction the arrow is pointing. Um, there's clearly a left, you know, from where the point of view of where you're standing, there's a left side and a right side to this line. And you want to determine, you have some other point and you want to determine is that point to the left of, to the right of, or on the line that you're standing on. And because the line is oriented, it, you, you can meaningfully talk about the left and right side. If this was just a plain line, not oriented, it's meaningless to talk about left and right side because the line, a plain line is completely symmetrical. You can't talk about a left and right side. But because it's oriented, it has a direction, we can meaningfully talk about left and right side and so on. Um, and it turns out, I'm not going to try to go through any of the derivations for any of this, but it turns out if you want to answer this question, it boils down to computing the determinant of a two by two matrix and checking the sign, not the trigonometric sign, but the arithmetic sign of the result. We care about whether the answer we get is positive, negative, or zero. And so if we basically take the coordinates of these points, which are the AX, AY, BX, BY, CX, CY, and plug them into this, this uh, matrix here and compute the determinant, what we care about is whether the answer we get is positive, negative, or zero. And these correspond uh, to the uh, point being to the left of, to the right of, or collinear, in other words, on the actual line itself through AB. So if we're using interval arithmetic here, the basic idea is we, we, we uh, apply interval arithmetic and we hope that the answer we get when we check to see whether or not the value is positive negative or zero we hope that when we're doing these tests that we don't get indeterminate results um, sometimes we will sometimes we won't uh, if we if we do then we fall back on exact arithmetic and i also for each of these predicates i have some examples with numerical computations they're kind of intended more when you're implementing things and you want maybe in it a few test cases that you can use initially. I mean, you probably want to use more than maybe just the ones that I've given, but at least it gives you kind of a starting point for some things that at least you, well, barring any typos on the slides, I think they all got resolved last year. Um, assuming that there's no typos on the slides, at least you have some test cases that you know should be correct results that you can test against initially. Uh, before I talk about the next uh, predicate, I first need to talk about uh, convexity. We can talk about polygons being convex or not convex or strictly convex. Um, so basically, we can, if, if a polygon is strictly convex, what this means is if you, if you take any two points on the boundary of the, the polygon, so maybe you take a point here and a point over here, and you connect them by a line segment, if the, if the shape is strictly, or if the shape is convex, then all the points along that line segment will be inside or on the boundary of the shape. It will never be outside. So like no matter how I choose two points on the boundary of this, this polygon here, 
If I connect that line segment that I get, the line segment is always going to be contained within the polygon or on the border of the polygon. So because of this, this, this particular polygon would be called convex. Um, strictly convex is an even more stringent condition. Is, is basically saying that the polygon not only is convex, but also all the interior angles in the polygon are less than 180 degrees. So if you look here, as we're going around, you know, going around the border of this uh, polygon here, none of the interior angles are, are greater than 180 degrees. Like this angle here, for example, is less than 180 degrees. This angle here is less than 180 degrees, and so on. Actually, they're, I think they're all equal. This looks like a regular, approximately a regular hexagon, I guess. Um, this would be an example of a shape that's not convex. So if it's not convex, again, what this means is that if there's, there's a pair of points that you can pick on the boundary of the shape that when you connect them by a line segment, the line segment is not completely contained within the, the, uh, the polygon or on its border. So for example, if I connect this point here to maybe a point over here and draw the line segment between them, all of that line segment except the two endpoints is actually outside of the polygon. So this would violate that convexity constraint. And then to illustrate what's meant by like strictly convex versus not strictly convex, this shape here is strictly convex. Um, if I kind of take this point here and kind of drag it upwards a little bit so that this angle becomes 180 degrees, so the angle here at this vertex is actually 180 degrees, this shape is convex, but it's not strictly convex because there's at least one angle that's, that's equal to 180 degrees. And anyway, so this gives you kind of the idea of, again, convex, strictly convex, non-convex. And the reason why we might care about these things from a practical point of view, when we're doing geometry processing, convex is nice because it, shapes that are convex, they can't be too bizarre in what they look like. Like you can't have things that kind of, well, this is, this is not that bad of a shape, but when things can become non-convex, you can have kind of like all these bites out, like all of these like pieces ripped out in very arbitrary ways from the shape. So you can have very, very highly complex shapes. Whereas when things are either convex or strictly convex, they, they can't be too complicated. So, Normally what this translates into is the algorithm, algorithms that are processing shapes that are convex are much, much simpler than things that have to deal with non-convex kind of shapes. So this is the reason why we might want to test for this sort of condition in, in a practical application. So if we want to test for uh, convexity, then how can we go about doing this? So um, basically what we can do, suppose that I'm kind of walking, I have a shape here, which is this kind of hexagon sort of shape. And I want to figure out whether it's you know, convex or strictly convex or whatever. Essentially what I want to do is I want to kind of stand on, on the edge and I'm going to walk around this, this shape, keeping the, the inside of the polygon on my left side. And I'm going to ask, like, as I'm walking from edge to edge, do I always make left turns? Um, if I always make left turns, then you, if you kind of think a lot more carefully about this, the eventual conclusion that you can come to is the shape must be uh, strictly convex. So the, the basic test that we would use here is we would um, for each pair of three consecutive vertices, if we want to test for convexity, we take like the vertices A, B, and C, which are consecutive, going around in a counterclockwise direction around the, the uh, polygon. And then what we want to do is we want to see is, is the line that goes through A, B, and then the, the point C, which is um, the next vertex along the boundary, we want to know is C to the left of A, B. In other words, when I'm walking along A, B, and then I turn onto this next edge here, am I making a left turn, effectively, is what I'm saying. And if it's the case that going all the way around the polygon, I'm always making strictly left turns, the shape is convex. Maybe it's not obvious, but if you kind of dig into like what the deep meaning of left turns is, essentially what it means is it's convex, and not just convex, it's strictly convex. Um, if, if, it's, if it's convex but not strictly convex, what will happen is something like what's shown in this shape here, where this is a, a shape which is convex but not strictly convex. It's not strictly convex because of this vertex here. It has an angle of 180 degrees for an interior angle. What will happen in this case, it's the same sort of algorithm. You're basically walking around the border in the counterclockwise direction saying, am I always hitting left turns? If you're always hit left turns, then basically it's strictly convex. If sometimes not only do you hit a left turn, but you also sometimes go straight. This is what happens here. When we're on the edge AB and then we say, well, how do we get to the next edge? Do we go left, right, or do we go straight? Well, in this case, we go straight to get to C. Um, so this would be uh, essentially another two-dimensional. These are all two-dimensional orientation tests that we just talked about before, where you have a point, you have a line, directed line, and you want to know is, is the point to the left of, to the right of, or on. This is basically an application of that. Um, in the case of a convex shape, as you can maybe uh, deduce sort of by the process of elimination, because we have left turns, right turns going straight, and we saw if it's always left turns, it's strictly convex. If it's left turns in combined possibly with some going straights, then it's uh, convex, but not strictly convex. If we have some right turns then, by the process of elimination, that's kind of the only other thing that's left out. 
we have right turns, then we have something that's not convex. So for example, if this shape here is not convex, if I'm walking around this shape, kind of going counterclockwise along the border, when I go from this edge here to the next edge over here, I'm going to have to make a right turn. Um, because I'm making a right turn, this, effectively this is going to be non-convex shape. So like algorithmically, this is what this slide is talking about, is algorithmically, how do we determine whether the shape is you know, convex, strictly convex, or non-convex? Basically, we walk around the border in the counterclockwise direction saying, are we hitting left turns, left turns, left turns only? Uh, if we have, so based on whether we only have left turns, or we have left turns and going straight, or we have some right turns, we can deduce whether things are convex, non-convex, or strictly convex. Any questions? So this is basically an application of the two-dimensional orientation test here, because we're basically just doing this repeatedly to figure out whether we're doing left turns, right turns, or going straight. Another type of, well, we can extend the idea of orientation test to higher dimensions. So we have what's called a three-dimensional orientation test, as opposed to what we talked about earlier, which was a two-dimensional orientation test. In the case of a three-dimensional orientation test, the only difference is instead of having a line, we have a plane. So we have a plane, it's an oriented plane, so by what we mean by oriented is there's a notion of the above side and the below side. Just like with an oriented line, there's like a left side and a right side, with a plane, you're either above it or you're below it. But it's oriented because just a plain, ordinary plane, well, I shouldn't say plain plane, but it's <laughs> like a, a non-oriented plane. A non-oriented plane, has, it's completely symmetrical, so there's, it makes no sense to talk about above or below it. Like it looks identical no matter how you look at it. So we, we orient it, and the way we orient it is we use, the way we define the plane is we give three points that are not collinear. Um, in other words, they're not all in a straight line. If you have three points which are not collinear, they always uniquely determine a plane. So in, in geometry processing, typically this is how we do things. We define a plane by giving three points, and there's a unique plane that passes through them, as long as the points don't fall on a, all on a straight line. Um, so the way we define the notion of above and below is, I would, I would, there's one way it's described, which is on the slide. The way I like to think of it is in terms of a right hand rule. If you take your fingers and cur of your right hand, and curl them around in the direction of ABC, then your thumb is going to point in the direction of the above side of the plane. Or the way it's explained on this slide here is it says if you imagine that you're standing on the plane kind of looking down at it, this, if you're standing on the above side of the plane, when you look down below, ABC will form a counterclockwise loop as opposed to clockwise. But basically either way you look at it, the, the two ways I described it, they're equivalent, whichever kind of works for you is, is fine. Um, and it turns out the way you answer this question, so we, what we have here is a point D, we have a plane here which is defined by the points A, B, C, and we want to know whether D lies above the plane, below the plane, or it's actually in the plane itself. Um, and it turns out that, again, you can do this by computing the determinant of a matrix and then checking the sign of the result, whether it's positive, negative, or zero. And, and the only thing that changes from the, the two-dimensional case is you just get a bigger, uglier matrix. It's a three-by-three three matrix instead of a two-by-two two matrix. Um, Anyway, and it turns out that the, when you compute this determinant, all we care about is the sign. And this is a partly what saves us with interval arithmetic, right? Like if we needed to know the, whether it's an exact value, um, we might have some difficulty. But if we just need to know the sign, for example, if we could do our computation with interval arithmetic, and we know the answer categorically must be between like minus two and minus one, then no matter what the true value is, we know it's negative. So we can conclude that it falls into the case here that would be negative, and then we can make a conclusion from this. Um, the zero thing is a little bit more tricky, though, um, but, but anyway, um, we'll worry about that maybe later. Um, any questions? So essentially, we compute this, we check the sign of the result of this determinant. If it's positive, negative, or zero, this corresponds to the point D being below, above, or on the oriented plane through ABC. Mm -hmm. uh, how exactly should we use general arithmetic here? Like, we're given the exact points, but uh, how do we choose the interval? Okay, maybe I should make one additional clarification, which is not direct, it's kind of related to the beginning part of what you're saying. It is safe to assume, by the way, that the, the actual points that you're given in the problem that you're solving are exactly specified. So even though they're floating point numbers in practice, you can, you can safely assume, or at least for the purposes of what we're doing and also in a lot of practical applications, it's safe to assume that the actual floating point numbers that you're starting out with are exact. There's no round off here already baked into them. Um, so all we have to worry about is error that's incurred by the subsequent floating point arithmetic that we're doing. For example, to compute the determinants of the matrices and so on here, um, which was only kind of very lightly touching on the very first thing you said, which is more of a statement, but I just wanted to clarify, it is actually valid to say that the data that you're getting to begin with is actually known exactly. But anyway, please restate your question because now I've forgotten the rest of the later part of it because uh, I don't think I answered it. Uh, yeah, it's, um, like here we know the exact point, but... How do we decide the interval, like the upper and lower bound? 
Well, like when you're starting out, things are easy because like when you're starting out, if you know that the value, so the inputs to the algorithm, so like when you're doing this orientation test, you're, you're assuming that the data that you're being given is specified exactly. So maybe you're being passed in like coordinates, which are floating point types, like floating point values to represent the coordinates. You assume that they're exactly as you're, that you're given with no error. So what this means is when you plug it into your interval or algorithm, the intervals will be like a trivial interval. The endpoint and starting point are the same. Like the interval, you know, maybe you're given the value 3.5. So your interval will be 3.5 to 3.5. And, and then that feeds into the algorithm. Of course, as you start to go through the algorithm with interval arithmetic, that range will probably start to expand because there will be in uncertainty introduced by the factor doing arithmetic computation. But to begin with, I think, which is what you're asking about, at the beginning, you're assuming that the data has no error. Therefore, the initial values you plug in are just kind of uh, basically a trivial interval. What I mean by trivial is the endpoints are the same. So it only contains a single number of the interval. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay, I think that's what you're asking. Any other questions? So again, there's for most of these, there's some examples that you can use to maybe help help for the purposes of testing. Um, the next uh, predicate that I want to talk about is the side of an oriented circle test. Um, and, and by the way, this notion of orientedness is kind of very typical when you're doing geometry processing. It's, it's often very undesirable not to have things with orientations because then it gets kind of fuzzy about like which side are you really talking about when you talk about sideness of things. With a circle, I guess you could, it's kind of clear something is inside a circle versus outside, but, but even still it's often useful to, to assign orientations to things. So um, when we talk about an oriented circle, what we're doing is we're, the circle is defined by three points. Um, if you have three points and they don't fall on the same line, there's always a unique circle that passes through them. So the way that we define a circle is by specifying three points. So A, B, C define a circle. And clearly in the diagram, they're not all in the same line. They're not collinear. So this is going to uniquely determine a circle. And then we have a fourth point here. And we want to figure out if this point is either, well, on the positive side of the circle or the negative side of the circle, or it's actually on the circle itself. Um, but what's meant by positive side, if you imagine that you're standing on the circle and you're walking around in the order A, B, C. So you're walking around the circle in the counterclockwise direction. In other words, the, the direction of increasing angles. Typically in computational geometry, people like to use counterclockwise for everything. Everything is counter counterclockwise, probably because it corresponds to a, a positive angle of rotation, like you're rotating in the positive direction. Anyway, so you're walking around the, the border of the circle in the direction that's counterclockwise, basically going from A to B to C, and what's on your left side is defined to be the positive side. What's on your right side is the negative side. Um, so it turns out that you can also determine make a determination about this sort of uh, problem. In other words, whether D lies on the positive side, negative side, or on the border of the circle by using a 3D orientation test. So what we do is, well, I don't really want to go through the derivation of it. This slide is kind of touching a little bit on where it comes from. Um, but basically what we do is we plug into a, a 3D orientation test with some particular formula, which I won't bother to explain here because uh, it's not so critical. And then based on, based on the result that we get from this, this uh, orientation test, which is going to give us a number which is positive, negative, or zero. If it's positive, negative, or zero, this corresponds to the point that we're testing being on the positive side, negative side, or on the boundary of the circle, the oriented circle. So like, uh, basically all these, these uh, predicates sort of all come down to eventually you're computing a determinant and you want to know whether the determinant is positive, negative, or zero. And again, there's some examples that you can go through on your own if it might help you from, for the purposes of testing your code. Um, I think this might be the last predicate I needed, or no, actually there's a couple more, I think. Uh, preferred direction test. So what this is, this is another type of geometric problem where we have two line segments, one that's uh, denoted by AB here, and an another line segment denoted by CD here, and then we have a vector, um, which is denoting some direction. And what we want to know is, is the direction of this vector closer to sort of the slope of this line segment or this line segment? The way that I've drawn things here, V is like closer in the direction it's pointing, then it's closer to AB than DC. The slope of V is kind of closer to AB. So for example, in this particular case, the answer we want to get is that V is like closer to AB. And the basic idea here is we want to assign a notion of a preferred direction. We're trying to choose between two different, like choose which of these two line segments is a direction which is closer. The preferred one is the one that's closer. Um, and there's a formula that we can use to do this. And all of these formulas basically involve additions addition, subtraction, and multiplication. You'll notice that none of them require division. This is the reason why we didn't have to worry in our cover coverage of interval arithmetic about worrying about the more complicated case where you might be dividing by zero. Because we're never doing division, we can't divide by zero because we don't even divide in the first place. 
and actually this is quite common in, in geometry processing, there may be some things where you need to do division, but a lot of the time you can get away without having to do division for quite a lot of fairly fancy sort of things. Um, anyway, so the, the vector dot products is just adding and multiplying and some squaring and so on, so adding, subtracting. So basically we compute this, this formula here, and then again, we're basically checking whether the result is positive or negative zero, and this corresponds to um, the, the orientation of, where is this? Let's get this right. What's the user compared to orientation of CD? Yeah, AB is either more close, less close, or equally close to the orientation of V relative to CD. Any questions? And again, there's also like a, some examples here that you can use for testing purposes. And then the kind of the, the main application that we are focusing on in this particular assignment that you're working on now, um, this is the part C part. It's there's this assignment actually has a part C. The previous assignment that you did, didn't have on this, the part C's are the ones that you get two free, at least if you're in the SN475, you get two uh, get out of jail free cards where you don't have to do the part C part of the assignment. Um, but in the part C of this part of the assignment, what you need to do is you need to compute a Delaunay triangulation. This is what I'm going to be talking about in subsequent slides. You're actually going to compute a triangulation of a set of points. And in order to do this, we basically need to use a number of the predicates that were discussed a little bit earlier. But before I can talk about this, obviously, I need to introduce what's a triangulation, because unless you've taken a course in computational geometry, which maybe some of you might have, there is a course offered in computer science on, on that topic, but I would imagine that the vast majority of you probably wouldn't have taken it. So I need to introduce what a triangulation is. So if we have a set of points, so this is what's denoted by V here, a, a triangulation is a set of triangles that satisfy certain relationships. And, and basically, um, the relationships are, are based on three things. So if I take the union of all the vertices of all the triangles, so I'm going to basically draw a bunch of triangulations that have the points in the points that I'm triangulating. So the points here that are shown in this diagram are the points from which I'm trying to construct the triangulation, what's called a triangulation, which is a bunch of triangles that satisfy certain properties. Um, the, the, if I take all the vertices of the triangles, um, I should end up with a set of points that I was starting out with. In other words, the vertices of the triangles are my points in my points that I'm triangulating. Um, the second property is that, the that any two triangles have to be disjoint except um, along their border. So they basically, they don't overlap with one another, the triangles. So if you look here, in this triangulation here, none of the triangles overlap, except they, they touch along the edges that they have in common that they share. But aside from that, their interiors never actually overlap. And then if I take the union of all the triangles, like basically kind of paste them all together and make some bigger shape, which is like this square shape here, um, the convex hull of that set of points is equal to the, the shape that's formed by the union of the triangles. And convex hull, in case you're not familiar with what this is, if you imagine that I take these points here that are sitting in the plane, take an elastic band and stretch it out and then let it snap tight around these points, the shape that is uh, the elastic band takes on is going to be the border of the convex hull. So like if you imagine I take an elastic band, stretch it outside of these points here and then let it snap tight on it, what you're going to get is this square, like this square which is like from here, like along here, down here, along here, and then up this side. So basically, the, if you take all the triangles together as one big shape, you should have the convex hull, which we do in this case. Basically, these triangles together form the shape of a square. So this is what's meant by the last point. Um, an example of something that would be invalid triangulation, this one here would be invalid because, for example, this, this uh, point here is not a vertex of a triangle. You just have a point sitting there on an edge. Uh, but this is, this is not allowed. So this is what's meant by a triangulation. Any questions about that? And then we have what are called Delaunay triangulation. So a Delaunay triangulation is a special case of a triangulation. It's a triangulation that satisfies certain additional properties, really, really namely one. Um, because a triangle is, uh, has three point, three vertices, and because those vertices can't be collinear, like a triangle, well, assuming the area, does, the area of the triangle is non-zero, like it doesn't collapse into a straight line or flat. Um, then you, you have three points which are non-collinear. Therefore, there's always like a, a circle that passes through each, each of the vertices of a triangle that's uniquely determined. So I can draw for each triangle, like for this triangle here, I can draw the unique circle that passes through the three vertices of this triangle, which is this dotted line circle here. This is sometimes called the circumcircle of the triangle. It's the unique, tri unique, unique circle that passes through the three vertices of the triangle. And I can compute all the circumcircles of all the triangles. And what's special about a Delaunay triangulation, the defining property of it is that if you look at all the circumcircles, and it's kind of hard to see because there's a lot of them, but if you, you go through carefully, you'll notice that 
none of the circumcircles have a point, like a vertex of a triangle, strictly inside the circumcircle. They're either outside, vertices are either outside of circumcircles or on the, on the border, but they're never inside. So this is a defining property of a, a Delaunay triangulation. It's just a triangulation where none of the circumcircles contain vertices of the, of the points that you're triangulating. And uh, this, would, this would be an example. So this is an example of a Delaunay triangulation because if you look very carefully, and it's kind of hard to see because there's a lot of circumcircles, but none of the circumcircles contain a vertex. Um, this would be an example of a triangulation that's not a Delaunay triangulation. The reason why is, for example, if we compute the circumcircle of, I guess it's this triangle here, the one with this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex, that's this big, big circumcircle over here. And you can see it contains like this vertex, it contains this vertex, it contains this vertex, this is not allowed. So this is not a Delaunay triangulation. And I have, I've got two new slides that aren't in the slides that you have. I'll put these on the course website. I didn't have time to do this because I just, I thought these would be some extra good things to add and I just added it this morning as I was thinking about the lecture. Hopefully there's no mistakes because I did it kind of very quickly because I really thought they'd be helpful. Um, one thing about the Delaunay triangulation is it's not uniquely determined. So this is what I'm trying to show on this slide. In other words, if you're given a set of points and you're asked to find the Delaunay triangulation of that set of points, it's not necessarily the case that there's only one correct answer. Typically, you'll have multiple correct answers you can get. And, and the re this is just trying to illustrate this. So for example, I have a point set of, of I guess it's nine points, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine points here. And then I'm asked to triangulate them. Um, so the lines that are shown here, if you ignore the dotted circles, which are showing circumcircles, um, the, these, these are, this is basically a valid triangulation of this set of points. It's also Delaunay, because if I draw the circumcircles of all the triangles, um, you'll notice that, and that's what these dotted line circles are, you'll notice that none of them contain vertices in their strict, strictly in their interior, so this satisfies the Delaunay property. But if I choose the edges in the triangulation to be a little bit different, so for example, I take this edge here and I flip it around, so now it's kind of this edge over here. Effectively, what I've done is in this square, this bottom left square here, this square has two diagonals, this diagonal here, and then this other diagonal from this vertex to this vertex. And essentially what I've done is I've deleted one diagonal and then replaced it by the other one. So I've deleted this diagonal of the square and replaced it by this one, which is over here. And I've actually done this for each of the edges. So this triangulation here is clearly different from this triangulation here. It has some edges that are different. But this one also satisfies the Delaunay property, because if you look at all the circumcircles of all the triangles, none of them contain a point strictly inside the interior of the circumcircle. And this particular kind of behavior happens quite frequently when you have points that are kind of on a grid, or some of the points are on a grid. It's very likely that you hit this kind of situation. Anyway, so the, the non-uniqueness of Delaunay triangulations is kind of undesirable. Like in general, when you're doing computation, it, it's often undesirable when you can get multiple right answers because it, it means that when you run algorithms, you're not really sure what you're going to get for the answer. In some cases, it's not a big problem, but in some cases, that lack of determinism can be a really big deal. Like you really like it that you run the code today, you get a particular answer. You run it another week from now, you get the same answer. Like you didn't change the code at all, whatever, but you, suddenly you get start getting different answers. It kind of makes things difficult to test, for example. So it's desirable that you not have maybe randomness introduced to the fact that there's actually multiple correct algorithms you could get. And, because a lot of geometric algorithm, algorithms exploit um, random number generators and so on, in other words, they introduce randomness deliberately to try to make things more efficient. Because of this, you might run exactly the same program, and if the algorithm, you know, you run exactly the same program to compute a Delaunay triangulation, you run it once, you get one answer, you run it again, you get a different answer, you run it again, you get a different answer, and, and it makes it kind of hard to test the code, right? Because maybe you have an expected answer that you're, you're going to check against, you don't get that answer, but it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just, there's multiple answers, maybe very many answers, and you have to kind of check against all of them. So it makes things kind of tedious for testing, but also generally it can cause problems in terms of whatever your end goal is that you're trying to achieve. When there's multiple answers, this can sometimes introduce undesirable sort of effects. Um, so because of this, there's various different strategies that have been proposed for how to, of all the possible Delaunay triangulations of a set of points, uniquely choose one of them in a deterministic way. And this is what we're going to look at, sort of the last piece of the puzzles I want to talk about, something called preferred directions Delaunay triangulations. And all this is, is a rule for saying if there's multiple Delaunay triangulations, it's a rule for uniquely choosing one of them in a deterministic way. Um, so this is the direction we're going. But I wanted to show this slide just to kind of help you understand a little bit better why it is that the triangulation could be not unique. And then this helps to motivate why it is that we might want to try to kind of over, overcome this practical problem that might be caused by the Delaunay triangulation not being unique. And this slide here, I think I don't really need to talk about because I've kind of covered the main points of it anyway. Um, 
So how do we compute triangulations? Um, with respect to this, there's something that's called an edge flip operation. So this is kind of a basic operation that we can apply to a triangulation. And the basic idea is if I have uh, what I'm showing here in this figure is just like a subset of a triangulation. There's maybe a whole bunch of other triangles out here, but I'm just showing like one little part of a, out of a triangulation. And I'm kind of focusing on this edge here, this label is E. Um, if an edge in a triangulation has two incident faces, that's just a fancy way of saying the edge basically is shared by two faces. So there are two triangles. There's a triangle on the left side, a triangle on the right side. So this edge here has two incident faces. So what I'm kind of working through is this definition at the top of what does it mean for an edge to be flippable. So it has to have two incident faces, which this edge does have. Um, and also the, the quadrilateral that's produced by taking the union of these faces. So if I glue the two faces together and treat it as basically a, a four-sided shape, which would be this shape here, like B1 to B2, or no, sorry, BL to BK to BJ to BI to BL. So this kind of square shape here. This is a quadrilateral. It's strictly convex. Uh, so if we have these properties, so the edge has two incident faces, like what's mentioned up here, and the union of these two faces is strictly quad, uh, convex quadrilateral. So you can see the interior angles of this kind of square-shaped quadrilateral. They're all less than 180 degrees, so it's strictly convex. Then we can define what's called a, a, well, first of all, the edge is called flippable, meaning that we can flip it. So that's the first part is kind of defining what's meant by flippable. If we can flip it, then I have to explain what is an edge flip operation. If it's flippable, it means we can do this thing called an edge flip to it. So what is an edge flip? Well, what, what an edge flip is, we just take this edge here and we delete it from the triangulation and we replace it by the other diagonal of this quadrilateral. So this quadrilateral, it has two, every quadrilateral has two diagonals. One is from VK to V, I can't read this, VI which is the one we have here, but the other diagonal is from VL to VJ. So we delete this diagonal and replace it by this one. In other words, we end up with what's shown over here. This is what we call an edge flip. Um, another way to think of it is you're kind of rotating the edge inside the square, but probably the easier way to think of it is you're deleting it and replacing it by the other diagonal. So this is what's called an edge flip. So the, the algorithm that we're gonna talk about a little bit later is based on edge flips. So this idea of you take, take, take an edge in a picture that looks like this, delete it, and then replace it by this flipped version. And it turns out that if you have a if you have two different triangulations of the same set of points, you can always get from one to the other by applying only edge flip operations. This is why edge flips are important. You can always transform one triangulation to another one. And this is essentially what we're gonna be talking about in terms of an algorithm that comes a little bit later. Any questions? So there's, there's uh, I think, two more predicates that I need to talk about in terms of being able to compute uh, what are called preferred direction Delaunay triangulations. So the first, first I want to focus on just plain ordinary Delaunay triangulation. So forgetting about this preferred direction stuff. So just triangulations that have the property that uh, none of the circumcircles of the triangles contain any vertices strictly on their interior. Uh, it turns out from a practical point of view, the way you can ensure that a triangulation is, is uh, Delaunay is you take each flippable edge in the triangulation. So we defined what flippable was on the previous slide. So for each flippable edge, check to see if that flippable edge satisfies a particular condition which is referred to as the local Delaunay condition. And this is what this predicate test is testing. So the, the kind of practical use of this predicate is if we have a triangulation and we want to test whether it's Delaunay or not, what we do is we, for each flippable edge, we iterate over all the flippable edges and we check to see whether this condition is satisfied, the one that this, this test tests for. Uh, so what it's testing for is we have the vertices of, well, we have like an edge that we want to check and see whether this edge has this local Delaunay property. And what we do is we, we take the three vertices of this triangle here. It doesn't matter which side we pick. Like you can kind of flip the picture around and kind of mirror it. And it's, it, it, it tests actually the same thing. It's not obvious, but, but basically it's kind of arbitrary which vertices we call it ABC and which, of the, which triangle is ABC, whether it's this one or this one. But suppose that we label this one as ABC. Uh, then what we have is a, is a uh, triangle which is oriented, uh, defined by ABC. So we have a, essentially the way this is going to work is we're going to be doing an uh, oriented circle test, like to check to see whether a, a point is inside, outside, or on the border of a, of a circle. So what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that for this, this uh, particular triangle here, ABC, that there's a circumcircle that passes through it. It's uniquely determined because ABC are not collinear. And then what we're going to do is we're going to check to see whether D um, is on the positive negative side or on the border of the circle. And essentially, if the point lies outside the circle, uh, this is good news with respect to Delaunay. If it lies inside, this is bad news. If it lies on the border, 
it's, it's okay as well. Like what we don't want is we don't want this point to be inside the circle. Because you can kind of see, like this is just kind of locally testing the Delaunay condition, hence the name local Delaunay test. It's just checking to see in this small part of the triangulation, does it kind of look like this might be Delaunay? What we're doing is we're checking to see, is this point here, which is another vertex in the tri triangulation, is it inside this circle here? Because if it is, this would immediately violate the Delaunay condition. Um, but it's not good enough just to check it for one, one triangle like this because we kind of need to check something globally for the whole triangulation. But it turns out that doing this test repeatedly over all the flippable edges is sufficient to guarantee that the triangulation is Delaunay. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So again, this is just kind of a smaller part of how we would manually check if something was Delaunay. We would basically um, take one of the circumcircles, so the triangulation, which is what's represented by this circumcircle here, and then we're checking to see is this point outside, inside, or on the border of the circle. And it should always be outside, like for or outside or on the border if it's Delaunay for every flip of legs that we test this for. <coughs> and again, this, this all basically boils down to just applying an in-circle test, this, this oriented circle test from before. So essentially what we're doing is kind of progressively building on the earlier predicates that we talked about. Um, and then the, la the last thing I need to talk about is a local, locally preferred directions Delaunay test. So the previous predicate on the previous slide we just talked about, the, the application of that would be if we want a Delaunay triangulation, but we don't care if we get multiple answers, so like it doesn't have to be like a specific one, we're just computing some Delaunay triangulation. If we want a preferred direction Delaunay triangulation, what this is, is we, just, we define an additional rule which kind of breaks ties, so that if there's multiple answers, we kind of break the ties between all these different multiple answers, so there's only one correct answer we can determinately, deterministically choose. In other words, we make the answer unique. Um, in order to do this, we kind of have to add a little bit of uh, extra uh, conditions onto the condition, that, the test that we just talked about before. And I think maybe I'll stop here for now because otherwise I'm, I'm going to have to probably start over again on this slide in the next lecture. Um, any questions? Okay.